On the 15th of April, 1912, the ocean liner Titanic sank on the fifth day of her maiden voyage. 1,523 passengers and crew died in the disaster. Over 70 years after the Titanic went down, research ships gathered over her resting place two and a half miles below the icy waters of the North Atlantic. Robot submarines were lowered into the water to probe the secrets of the most famous shipwreck of them all. In Halifax, Nova Scotia, a graveyard contains the bodies recovered from the sea after Titanic sank. They met their deaths in the mightiest ship of the day, the largest man-made moving object which had ever been built. The Titanic had been dubbed unsinkable by the press, and the safety features she incorporated were the most advanced in the world. like an Atlantic fog, mystery still shrouds the fate which overtook Titanic on that freezing night in 1912. How was it that the unsinkable ship could go down so swiftly and with so great a loss of life? The Titanic was the pride of the British White Star Line. She was 882 feet long, displaced 66,000 tons, and could carry 2,230 passengers. But she was not unique. She had a sister ship, the Olympic, from which she was virtually indistinguishable. Both liners were built in Belfast at the Harland and Wolfe shipyard. Olympic was the first of the two ships to slide down the slipway on the 20th of October 1910, her passage into the water eased by 23 tons of grease. Six months later, on the 31st of May, 1911, as Olympic was being readied for her maiden voyage, Titanic was launched. Within minutes, she was floating gracefully in the River Lagan before being towed to her berth for fitting out. The VIPs who gathered that day included the American magnate, John Pierpoint Morgan. White Star might be a British company, but its ultimate owner was Morgan through his International Mercantile Marine Company. It was a time when the transatlantic passenger trade was booming. The only way to cross the Atlantic was by ship. The White Star Line was locked in a cutthroat competition with the Cunard Line for the lion's share of the transatlantic trade. Cunard's two 30,000 tonners, Mauritania and Lusitania, were certainly faster. Mauritania held the blue ribbon for the fastest crossing of the Atlantic from 1907 to 1929. But Olympic and Titanic were bigger and could carry many more passengers. And those who sailed first class enjoyed the last word in ocean-going luxury. The great liners, and in particular White Star's great ships, were like huge floating hotels. The magazine engineer reported that Titanic had been built for comfort rather than speed.
The safety of the Titanic was, in theory at least, guaranteed by a system of 15 watertight bulkheads. These were of varying heights, but all of them rose to at least two and a half feet above the waterline. Titanic was designed to stay afloat if any two of the 16 transverse compartments formed by the bulkheads were flooded. Shipbuilder magazine called Titanic practically unsinkable. Less cautious journalists dispense with the niggling qualification. She was unsinkable. If the impossible did happen, there were only 20 lifeboats on Titanic, capable of carrying less than half of the maximum complement of passengers and crew. This was perfectly in accord with the regulations, which had not been updated since 1894, and were based on a ship's tonnage, not the number of passengers and crew she carried. White Star was an accident-prone shipping line. On the 20th of September, 1911, less than four months after her maiden transatlantic voyage, Titanic's sister ship, Olympic, was involved in a serious collision in Southampton water with HMS Hawk, one of the Royal Navy's armored cruisers. The cruiser's ram tore two great gashes in Olympic's stern and badly damaged her propellers and crankshaft. The wounded Leviathan had to return to Belfast for repairs. They were to take nearly seven weeks and cost White Star 250,000 pounds, one sixth of the liner's original building costs. No sooner was Olympic back at sea than she ran over a wreck and lost a propeller blade. Back to Belfast she went for more repairs. On the 2nd of April, 1912, after successful sea trials, Titanic left Belfast for Southampton to take on passengers for her maiden transatlantic crossing. The stores she picked up included 20,000 bottles of beer, 1,500 bottles of wine, 32 tons of fresh meat, 40 tons of potatoes, 800 bundles of fresh asparagus, and 8,000 cigars. No one aboard Titanic would go hungry on her maiden voyage, and her saloons and bars would be blue with tobacco smoke. But she was not carrying a full complement of passengers. Fewer than a thousand boarded at Southampton, 427 of them in first and second class, and 495 in third class. Nevertheless, Titanic's designer, Thomas Andrews, aboard for the voyage, wrote to his wife, the Titanic is now about complete and will, I think, do the old firm credit when we sail tomorrow. There were still many notables on the Titanic as she steamed out of Southampton. But one important absentee was J.P. Morgan, who had cancelled at the last minute, pleading ill health. The first stop was to be Cherbourg, in northern France, where another 244 passengers would come on board. 20 fortunate cross-channel passengers would go ashore. Among the first-class passengers were a number of people of immense wealth. Colonel John Jacob Astor, said to be worth $30 million, over a billion in today's money. Benjamin Guggenheim, another member of a fabulously rich immigrant American dynasty. And Isidore Strauss, the owner of Macy's department store in New York. Taking a free ride in one of Titanic's millionaire suites was Joseph Bruce Ismay, the British chief executive of the White Star Line. Traveling more modestly were the third class passengers mostly emigrants on their way to start a new life in America. One fact that none of Titanic's passengers were aware of was that deep in the bowels of the ship, a coal fire was burning in one of her bunkers. It had started several days before, but had not been drawn to the attention of the inspectors who boarded the liner at Southampton. Bestriding the bridge of the Titanic 
was the reassuringly bewhiskered figure of Captain Edward John Smith, the White Star Line senior, and at 1,250 pounds a year, the highest paid seaman in the world. It was his job to command all White Star's new liners on their maiden voyages. He planned to retire after this trip. Smith radiated confidence and command, but he had been on Olympic's bridge when she was rammed by HMS Hawk. He was also there when Olympic hit the wreck. And, as Titanic left Southampton, the speed at which Smith took her out caused the liner New York to spring her moorings. A collision was narrowly avoided. After picking up passengers and mail in Cherbourg, Titanic sailed to Queenstown on the southwest coast of Ireland. There she took on more passengers and 1,400 sacks of mail. Then she weighed anchor at 1.30 p.m. on the 11th of April and steamed majestically out into the Atlantic. On the orders of Joseph Bruce Ismay, Smith now accelerated into an area of the Atlantic where there was a gathering ice threat. The winter had been the mildest for years. Numerous icebergs had broken away from the polar ice caps and drifted with the Labrador current into the Atlantic. To avoid the ice, White Star had charted a southerly course for Titanic. Under normal conditions, this should have kept her well away from any ice fields. But the ice had moved farther south than Captain Smith had anticipated. Nevertheless, it seems that Joseph Bruce Ismay was determined that Titanic should beat her sister ship Olympic's best time for the Atlantic. At gathering speed, Titanic was sailing straight into danger. On Sunday the 14th of April, as Titanic crossed the Grand Banks, she received the first of six clear ice warnings. The second warning from the White Star liner Baltic was pocketed by Ismay and not posted in Titanic's chart room for several hours. Oblivious of this, the passengers had settled into the routines of shipboard life. Even those in second class had cabins the equal of other lines first class accommodation. While first class passengers promenaded up and down the impressive main staircase and enjoyed the splendor of the first class dining room where the hum of conversation drowned the distant throb of Titanic's mighty engines. That fifth night of the voyage, filet mignon, roast duckling and sirloin of beef were on the menu. By that time, Titanic was moving well into the danger zone. The last ice warning came by signal lamp at 10.30 p.m. from SS Rappahannock, have just passed through heavy ice and several icebergs. The message was acknowledged by lamp from Titanic's bridge and could have left no doubt that she was now in a major ice field. Yet her speed was maintained. Up in Titanic's crow's nest, Seaman Frederick Fleet was straining his eyes for ice. There were plenty of binoculars available for the task, but he did not have any in his freezing perch. The sky was bright with stars and the sea like a mill pond. The absence of wind made it more difficult to spot an iceberg since there were no breaking waves, which would have been quickly spotted by lookouts. As it was, Fleet had no time. At 11.40 p.m., he saw a huge mass dead ahead. His warning bell, which caused the liner to swing to port, told the end for Titanic. 40 seconds and 500 yards later, she struck the iceberg a glancing blow. Quantities of ice cascaded onto Weldeck Sea between Titanic's bridge and forecastle. On the bridge, Second Officer Charles Lightoller felt a slight shock, a slight trembling and a grinding sound. It took the iceberg, reeking of rotting fish, just 10 seconds to open Titanic up like a sardine can. The Titanic's designer, Thomas Andrews, went below with Captain Smith to inspect the damage. Five of Titanic's watertight compartments were flooded and water soon spilled over into a sixth. How long have we got? Smith asked. Andrews replied, an hour and a half, possibly two, not much longer. Strangely, it took another 15 minutes before Titanic's powerful Marconi wireless telegraphy apparatus sent out the first in a long series of distress signals. Another 25 minutes passed before an order was given to prepare the lifeboats. And it was not until 12.55 a.m. 
that the first was launched. When it became clear to Benjamin Guggenheim that Titanic could not be saved, he went to his cabin and, with his valet, donned full evening dress to die like a gentleman. Although the orders were women and children first, Isidore Strauss's wife Ida refused to leave her husband, declaring, as we have lived, so we will die, together. John Jacob Astor bade goodbye to his pregnant wife and stepped back to await death. The tragedy of the Titanic was compounded by the fact that the crew mistakenly believed that the lifeboats could not be lowered fully loaded. Only the last few boats to leave the ship were crowded. Many left half empty, while officers armed with pistols held passengers back. It was an incredible scene. Distress rockets burst over the brightly lit ship. Through the roars of steam released to prevent the boilers exploding came the strains of the ship's orchestra, running through its repertoire from ragtime to religious music. At 1.55 a.m., the last lifeboat slipped away into the ice field. The band struck up, nearer my God to thee. 1,500 passengers and crew, nearly all men, were left behind. But not Joseph Bruce Ismay, who had stepped into a lifeboat after his wife. At about 2.20 a.m., Titanic began her death throes. She had been sinking steadily by the bow, but now she began to plunge more steeply, sending the hundreds left on board towards the stern. A funnel broke free and crashed into the water, crushing scores of people swimming desperately for survival. There was a series of deafening explosions as her boilers broke free and crashed through her. Her lights, kept going by the heroic efforts of the ship's engineers, finally flickered out. The air trapped in her stern kept her afloat for a last few minutes. she was gone, and all was silence. At least 16 ships had heard Titanic's distress calls, one of which was the very first SOS signal in maritime history. But only one ship, the Cunard liner Carpathia, arrived on the scene with sufficient speed to make a difference. Her captain, Edward Rostron, made 24 knots through the ice to Titanic's reported position clearing his ship's decks for action and firing rockets from her bows to signal his approach. Rostron plucked 705 numb and shivering survivors from the lifeboats and made for New York. News that Titanic was in trouble had reached the press in New York in the small hours of the 15th of April. But the full story was not known until Carpathia arrived on the evening of the 18th of April. The newsmen were waiting for the survivors, checkbooks in hand. Ghouls were about too. When Carpathia lowered Titanic's lifeboats, they were stripped that night for souvenirs. Later, Titanic's name was sanded off. The press swarmed over the crew who had manned the lifeboats. In the shocked aftermath, there was many a tale to tell. Among them, reports that a well-lit ship had passed within sight of the Titanic, but failed to heed her signals. Titanic's crew had to rely on charity. Their pay ceased when the ship went down. Captain Rostrum was the hero of the hour. In Britain, the press was already picking up the themes of Titanic's high speed and lack of lifeboats. Ships were now searching for bodies in the area where Titanic went down. The Mackay Bennett, which set sail from Halifax on the 22nd of April, picked up 190 bodies and buried 116 of them at sea. In London, a memorial service for the dead was held at St. Paul's Cathedral. There was such a crush that thousands filled the streets outside.
Two inquiries, American and British, followed the disaster. The Americans were at pains to fix the blame for the deaths of so many of their fellow countrymen on British incompetence. The British inquiry was marked by frequent muddles between Titanic and Olympic and arguments about where exactly Titanic went down. It also investigated the phenomenon of the so-called mystery ship, which had been reported close by, but which was never identified. Some have doubted its existence, but not survivors like Eva Hart, who escaped from the Titanic with her mother. Her father went down with the ship. I am bitter against whichever ship it was. There was a ship close enough to have come to our rescue, and it didn't. But another scapegoat was at hand. Captain Lord of the California had ordered his ship to heave to about 20 miles to the northeast of Titanic. His radio was switched off and Lord was asleep, but his officers did see Titanic's distress rockets. But this was only 50 minutes before Titanic sank, too late for California to steam to the rescue. Nevertheless, to the end of his days, Lord bore much of the blame for loss of life. Nor did Joseph Bruce Ismay escape unscathed. No one believed his bluster that he was just an ordinary passenger on Titanic. Ismay was to claim that he had undergone an early version of trial by newspaper. But did his very presence aboard encourage Smith recklessly to maintain his speed and ignore clear warnings that he was standing into danger? Curiously, Titanic's log went down with her. Was this simply the result of confusion or was it a deliberate attempt to lose the evidence of Joseph Bruce Ismay's orders to Captain Smith? Had Titanic been sailing more slowly, she might have been able to avoid the iceberg. Even if she had hit the berg head on, Titanic would not have sunk. But the gash in her side was at a point where Titanic's plates of mild steel had been made brittle by the freezing water. Three million rivets had been designed into her. At that fatal moment, many of those below the waterline were sprung. But what if it was not Titanic that was taken by the sea? In recent years, an ingenious theory suggested that Titanic and Olympic had been switched when Olympic came in for her second round of repairs at Belfast in March 1912. Perhaps the loss making Olympic had been crippled by her two collisions. Titanic, nearing completion, was virtually identical. Why not switch them? and then right off Olympic in the North Atlantic in a crowded sea lane where the rescue of passengers and crew could be counted on. At the British inquiry after the trial, were the inspectors unwittingly examining Titanic rather than Olympic? If switch there had been, it would have been one of the biggest insurance frauds of all time. J.P. Morgan was a man of sufficient ruthlessness to have sanctioned such a desperate measure. He cancelled his trip on Titanic on the grounds of ill health. A few days after she sank, Morgan was found, apparently healthy and happy, at a French spa with his mistress. But the ingenious switch theory was exploded in 1994, when items salvaged from the wreck of Titanic were examined. The Titanic had a hull number, 401, which was stamped on all its major parts. When the helm indicator from the stern bridge was recovered alongside more everyday objects, it bore the number 401 stamped into its bronze stamp. There could be no doubt that it was the Titanic which lay on the seabed, surrounded by the poignant debris of the disaster. Many of the victims lie elsewhere, their graves asking the question, how had the unsinkable Titanic, the greatest ship of her day, come to grief? She had seemed like a triumph of engineering, a symbol of man's mastery of the physical world. But it was the physical world, in the form of an iceberg, which sank her, able to do so because of inherent faults in her design. The other causes were all too human. Captain Smith's reckless disregard of a series of danger signals, egged on by the equally reckless Joseph Bruce Ismay. Between them, they doomed the ship.
and it was the spurious legend of her unsinkability that doomed many of Titanic's passengers. They delayed clambering into the lifeboats, little realizing the peril they were in. When they did, it was too late.